I'm Bob Klein from Los Angeles. I wonder if you could give us a glimpse into your investment process, the way you approach looking at a particular industry. And I wonder if you could use real estate as an example. I know real estate hasn't been a big, huge part of Berkshire's portfolio over the years. And I wonder if that's because you view real estate as a commodity business, or if maybe the cash flows from real estate tend to be more predictable than perhaps from some other industries, and thus uh, it tends to be l less likely to be mispriced and, and therefore less likely to find terrific bargains in real estate. So, go ahead. so just wondering if we could, uh, if, if we were watching a discussion between you and Charlie hashing out uh, the merits of real estate, how, how it would go. Well, it would go like all our other conversations. He would say no for about 15 minutes. <laughs> And I would gauge by the, the by the degree to which he the motion he put into his nose whether he really liked the deal or not. But the, uh, we, we both had a fair amount of experience in real estate, and Charlie made his early money in real estate. Uh, the second point is the more important point: that real estate is not a commodity, but it I think it tends to be more accurately priced particularly developed real estate, more accurately priced most of the time. Now, during the RTC period, when you had huge amounts of transactions and you had a you had an owner that didn't want to be an owner in a very big way and they didn't know what the hell they owned and all of that sort of thing, I mean, you had a lot of mispricing then, and I know a few people in this room that made a lot of money off of that. Uh, but under most conditions, it's it's hard to find real estate that's really mispriced. I mean, when I look at when I look at the transactions that REITs engage in currently, and you get a lot of information on that sort of thing, you know, they're they're very similar. But it's a competitive world, and and you know, they all know about what a Class A office building in you know in Chicago or wherever it may be is going to produce. So at least they have they may all be wrong as it turns out because of some unusual events. But but it's hard to argue with the current conventional wisdom most of the time in the real estate world. But occasionally there have been some, you know, there, there, there could be big opportunities in the field. But if, it, if they exist, it will certainly be because there's a, there probably there'll be a lot of chaos in real estate financing for one reason or another. We've done some real estate financing and uh, uh, you have to have the money shut off to quite a degree, probably to get any big mispricing uh, across the board. Charlie? Yeah, we, we don't have any competitive advantage over experienced real estate investors in the field. And we wouldn't have if we were operating with our own money as a partnership. And if you operate as a corporation, such as ours, which is taxable under Chapter C of the Internal Revenue Code, you get a whole layer of corporate taxes between the real estate income and the use of the income by the people who own the real estate. So by its nature, real estate tends to be a very lousy investment for people who are taxed under Subchapter C of the uh, code relating to corporations. So the combination of having it generally allows the activity for people with our tax structure and having no special competence in the field means that we spend almost no time thinking about anything in real estate and then such real estate as we've actually done like holding surplus real estate and trying to sell it off. I'd say we have a poor record at it. Yeah, C corps really do, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, I know there are C corps around that, that that are in real estate, but there are other structures that are more attractive. There really aren't other structures. Uh, I mean, Lloyd's is an attempt at it to some degree, but there aren't other structures that work well for big insurance companies. Or, I mean, you can't have a Walmart very well that that does not exist in a C corp. So, they are not subject to S corp or partnership competition that determines the returns on capital in, 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 in the discount store field. But if you're competing 
with S, the equivalent of S corps, REITs, uh, or partnerships or individuals, you're, you've just got an economic disadvantage uh, as a C corp, which is for the, those of you who don't love reading the Internal Revenue Code, it's just a standard vanilla corporation that you think of all of the Dow Jones companies, all of the S and P companies, and so on. And uh, uh, the, as Charlie says, it's unlikely that that the disadvantage of our structure combined with the competitive nature of people with better structures buying those kinds of assets will ever lead to anything really interesting. Although I would say that we missed the boat to some extent during the RTC days. I mean, uh, it was a sufficiently inefficient market at that time and there was a lack of financing that uh, we, we could have made a lot of money if we were, had been geared up for it at that time. We, we actually had a few transactions that were pretty interesting, but not, but nothing that was significant in relation to our total capital. We thought significantly about buying the Irvine Corporation when it became available. So, but that's the only big one I can remember that we seriously thought about. Yeah, that, that that was in 1977 or so. Way back. Yeah, Mobile Oil was interested in, you know, Don Brent ended up putting together a group for it. But, you know, that kind of thing could conceivably happen, but, but uh, it's unlikely.